Our young friend here, Jones, asks the highly pertinent question, why do we learn Spanish? Why indeed? Because I have been trying to teach it now for many years with no sense of mission higher than that of caressing my meager wages. <laughs> yes, meager wages. But if we consider the question philosophically, why do we here in South Wales learn this or any other a peculiar language? Because I can see no virtue at all in the multiplicity of tongues. And I have never spoken a foreign language without an intolerable sense of taking part in the worst kind of amateur theatricals. However, and I naturally include the school play in that category. <laughs> however, however, I'm often consoled and on alternate days I am inspired by the memory of those teachers who taught me. And they kept at us like huntsmen. Their voices had the precise quality of hallowing bugles. So you see, teaching and learning were not things of beauty. No, they were rope ladders designed to help us up a lift shaft of academic grace from a darkened and ghastly underworld to a lightened surface. And that is why I'm here, to help you boys from that underground darkness into Mr. Clement Attlee's gleaming paradise. All right, Jones? Then let us find a few amiable verbs. We will conjugate them together to enlighten. It was through teaching that I met Mr. Wolford, a man who is frequently caught in my thoughts. He'd come from a small village in Carmarthen and in spirit had never left. He regarded our school and the industrial area in which it was located as a squalid impertinence. The day invented 150 years ago. Why do I show you this? Because it was the last occasion that a scientist did anything useful. Don't be fooled by what you read in examination papers. Einstein and Rutherford were makers of mischief. Ignore them. Go out for a walk. Find a nice meadow and stare at it. He'd heard that I'd been a field worker on those researches into social gloom on which the beverage blueprint for the welfare state was based. There are rumors circulating about you here in the staff room. Yes, that is why we have staff rooms. It is said you dallied with socialism in your youth. Yes, I still have the membership card. Countersigned by Trotsky. And you didn't fight in the war. I applauded politely from my doorway. Were you a conscientious objector? No, no, merely an opportunist. I was examined by doctors. They counted my buckled nerves and shredded reflexes. When they got past a thousand, they decided I should be kept well away from guns. Unless, of course, uh, Churchill decided to shoot me anyway for reasons of his own. This confirms what I was told. That during the war, you helped contribute to the beverage report. <laughs> no, no, no. I was a, a mere asterisk or a mild footnote on the subject of education. And now, thanks to you, we have a welfare state and education paid for by taxes. No, not thanks to me. A vote was taken in 1945, you know. You should have kept away from that man, Beverage. Helping people corrupts them. The state helping people corrupts them fastest of all. Huh? Come with me, I want to show you something. Is, Thomas? Looks like a brush. It's a broom. A rustic broom. You know there are people who buy brushes in shops. Yes, my wife and I have read about such people in the newspapers. You'd be well advised to learn how to make one of these. I shall make it item one on my agenda. These places aren't going to last. All these schools and colleges. 
Just a passing foolery. You and I saying things we don't want to say to boys who don't want to hear. But dirt will be with us to the end. Mr. Walford says I should make you a broom. Yes, I know all about Mr. Walford's brooms. You do? Yes, Mrs. Walford told me about them. Does she use them? Only when he's at home. When he's at school, she does the cleaning properly with the hoover. Does he know about the hoover? Oh, no. It's in the closet, double locked. Did I finish the proofs? Mm. Oh, your turn. Right. Mr. Walford's father built coracles for a living. Really? Yeah. Tranquil trade. Mr. Walford keeps bees. He's promised me a bottle of homemade mead. Probably lethal. Why is it that wherever I go, the resident lunatic always heads straight for me? Because you always listen, Gwyn. And you like what you hear. Tell me about this. It was at least five years before Mr. Walford discovered that I was a writer. You write books? Yes. Grammar books? No, uh, novels. Novels? Mm. Do you read novels? I browse selectively. My library is modest, but each volume has to pass a high laundry test. Fresh as morning mint. Treasure Island, the cloister and the hearth, scenes from the life of an old armchair. Clean as mountain springs, all of them. These novels of yours, is there anything immoral in them? No. Just about as sexless as can be. I mean, my characters occasionally acknowledge the existence of the libido, but I, uh, I never march it around the parade ground. Tell you what I'm going to do, Thomas. I'm going to read one of your novels. Might even buy one from a shop, if necessary. Just to prove that I'm ready to be foolhardy in the name of tolerance. About five minutes, that'll get you warm. Good. I lapse into uncritical boredom at the sight of any physical activity requiring an arbiter or an organizer. Moving swiftly from one place to another purely for the sake of movement has always seemed to me the ultimate in futility. Come on, boys, you know the rules. Not supposed to smoke here. Why do you think we've got lavatories and bicycle sheds? Come on, off you go. Don't let the headmaster see you. All right? Thomas! One of my swarms is missing. Well, that must be very disconcerting. I was thinking they might have followed me to school like little bull peep sheep. Oh, yes. Oh, don't worry. Bees are amiable creatures. I've been reading your book. Oh, yes? I've got to the bit about the white raincoat. I don't remember that. Which uh, book are you reading? You have two characters alone on a mountaintop. Ah, yes, I remember now. Yes, as I recall, um, the incident occurred during a rainy spell in the story, and they placed the white raincoat on the ground as a sensible precaution against the possibility of pneumonia. I don't think concern for pneumonia had anything to do with it, Thomas. No? And I have to tell you, your book is definitely going behind my other books to join Lady Chatterley and the Blue Lagoon. Well, I didn't think you had any literature of that kind. Well, if it wasn't for your white Mac and your black imagination, you'd never have known, would you? No? <laughs> oh, forgive me. I almost forgot. I have a present for you. Mead. Oh. I made it myself. Try it. Thank you. To all the things that went away and had the sense never to return.
Mr. Walford moved off a little more slowly, as if there was a point just in front of him which he did not want to see or recognize. 